Well, good morning and welcome to the uh, seminar this morning. We're delighted to welcome back for the third in the series uh, Professor John White, who's Emeritus Professor of Neonatal Medicine, University College London, and the author of uh, a number of very helpful books on uh, a Christian approach to medical ethics and uh, Christian living. And our subject this morning is the vital subject of dementia. It affects so many of us in one way or another. And uh, I want to uh, start by, uh, with a prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you we can gather here this morning. And we, we pray that uh, as your servant John uh, uh, speaks to us this morning, uh, you'd help us all to uh, understand this subject better, to know how to approach it uh, should it affect us, and to know how to love and serve those around us who may also be affected by this. We pray that we will learn how to be good family members, how to be good church family members, uh, and we pray that we may display uh, your glory all the more in our lives as a result. Amen. John. Well, thank you much, very much, Alasda, for that uh, introduction again, and uh, it's a great privilege for me uh, to be here. Now, this is the third of our series of four seminars. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat this morning, so if I uh, cough from time to time. And um, the first session, we looked at the issues around retirement, and uh, at the end of, of today's uh, I'll, I'll be introducing Helen Calder, who, uh, who's very helpful course, Retiring Well. Uh, it, she's the leader of that. And um, if, if you're interested, it, particularly in the topic of retirement, that would be something that may be helpful for you. Uh, the second se seminar, we looked at the topic of um, dependence. And now this one, we're looking at the challenge of dementia. And um, I have to say, I think out of the four seminars that I've been preparing, this is the one I have found the most challenging uh, because it's a topic on which still uh, Christian thinking, Christian engagement is still at a relatively underdeveloped stage. And, and yet, this is, it seems to me, such a critical and crucial topic for us as Christian believers and for the Christian community the Christian church, as we go on into this world which God has given us. Uh, and, and so maybe for some of you here, you've come with anxieties, with confusion, with concern. Uh, as we'll see, this is an issue which touches um, most of us. In fact, I think I can say that probably everyone uh, in this tent uh, today has been uh, or will be touched by this issue of dementia in some very personal way. So, so this is not just a theoretical uh, discussion. I'm very well aware this is something that, that cuts right to the heart of who we are and our experience of following Christ. And a vital part, therefore, in this race. God has given us a marathon to run, you remember, and he's marked out for us the race, the individual race that we're called to run. And for many of us, he is marking out, it seems, the, the strange path of dementia. So how can we learn to be faithful servants, both uh, if we ourselves might be affected by dementia, but also as we care for others? And as I was reflecting on... Um, on the scripture verse, it was really the same scripture verse which we looked at on Tuesday, which seems to me so important. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, the things that are unseen are eternal. And so, as we grapple with this 
uh, complex issue of dementia, one of the vital things we need are these spiritual spectacles which are able to penetrate th through the surface appearance, through the body, the brain which is wasting away, to the truth which is the spiritual reality cannot be touched. And as we also looked at on Tuesday, in the scriptures there is, is this constant connection between suffering and glory. Suffering and glory are seen in the Scriptures as the two sides of the same coin. It seems there's no suffering without glory. There's no glory without suffering. These things go together, and particularly in the, in the field of dementia, in the area of dementia. So, what strikes me as I've had conversations with many <clears throat> people over the years is that whereas previously for so many people cancer, the big C, was the thing that most people dreaded and prayed against, actually for most of us dementia has replaced cancer as the most feared illness. It's the thing that for people, if they're honest, they're most frightened about, both for themselves or for their loved ones. And it seems to me, I've noticed that for Christian believers, it often seems to carry a particular horror. And one of the things I've, I've sort of tried to think about, why is that? Why do so many Christians, and if I may say so, particularly evangelical Christians or Christians uh, from a charismatic background, why is it that dementia is so feared. And I think part of the reason is, is that in our evangelical faith and our, and our practice, we put such an emphasis on the mind, on understanding the Bible, on understanding why Christ died for us, on claiming the promises, on living every day uh, in thinking through and what God has done for us. And therefore, the terrible fear is, if I start to lose my mind, if I can't even remember the Scriptures, if I can't even remember why Christ died for me, if I've forgotten uh, what, what uh, the, my faith is based on, on how I came to faith, on the way that Christ led me, if I lose these things, then what happens to me? Who am I? I'll come back to that, that um, troubling question. But first of all, just very briefly, a medical perspective. Now, of course, this is a huge topic. Uh, I haven't got time to go into detail into some of the medical features. And actually, there are many books now written uh, which provide helpful medical uh, uh, information uh, for people if, if you want to find further. So, I'm not going to emphasize that, but just the statistics, a few statistics, and they are quite striking. In, at present, in the UK, we have almost a million people who are affected by dementia personally, who are living with the condition. And this is estimated to rise to 1.6 million by 2050. And what is very clear is that there's this very strong age relationship. So, just to emphasize, dementia is not the same as healthy aging. It's not a normal process. It's a disease. It's a, it's a pathological process which only some people suffer from. But, as you can see, with every five years that goes on from 60, to 60, uh, from 60 onwards, your chances, the risk of developing dementia increases. Um, so uh, if you take all people in the age group 60 to 64, only 1% have dementia, about, or less than 1%. By the time you get to my age group, and I'm in the 70 to 74, it's about 3 to 4% of people in my age group who have dementia. By the time you get to people in the 80s, it's over 10%. By the time you get to people in their 90s, it's 44% uh, for women. The light blues are women, and the, the darker blues are men. So at every age group, there is a higher instance in women compared with men. So 
the important thing to take from this is that, yes, your risk of getting dementia increases as you get older, but even in your 90s, the majority of people don't have dementia. So uh, it's not true that everybody is going to get it. Many of us will know people in their 90s who have absolutely no, who are able to think clearly and who are not affected by this disease. But your risk of getting it, uh, getting it increases as you get older. And this is a very striking statistic, uh, that one in two of us will be affected by dementia in our lifetime, either by caring for someone with the condition or developing it ourselves, or both. And therefore, it's so vital that we talk about this, sisters and brothers, uh, that we actually face this. You know, it is the fear of the unknown which is so much worse than the fear of the known. I've seen this time and time again in my medical career. And the evil one uses our fear of the unknown to, to create anxiety and disturbance and depression and despair. And, and what, we're calling, what we're called to do is to shine the light of God's truth into the reality. And that doesn't mean sometimes the truth is painful, but it's much better to face the truth with the light, the light of truth and the light of the gospel. <clears throat> so dementia is not in itself a diagnosis. There are many conditions uh, such as Alzheimer's disease, such as uh, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia. There are many different conditions and they've all got slightly different patterns of impairment. But memory impairment is one of the central features in, in pretty well all the conditions with dementia. And a helpful image uh, which comes from a book from, by Joanna Cullicut, which I will uh, refer to a bit later. I found this a helpful image. And the idea is that all of us have in the back of our minds a storage cupboard where all the memories of everything that's ever happened in our life are there stored. And that we can always go to the storage cupboard and reach back and look for a memory uh, going all the way back to childhood. Uh, and we know that in that storage cupboard is just thousands and thousands of memories. But then what happens as this dementia process develops is that gradually that door is, is being shut uh, against my will. I'm finding that the door to the storage cupboard is getting harder and harder to open. At first, I can still reach in some, but I'm finding it harder to get the door. And eventually that door shuts until there's just a crack and I can just, can just see through. There are a few little things that just, and then eventually that, it, that door seems to shut completely. But the emotional tone of the memories is something that's much deeper stored than actually the content. So even though I can't remember exactly what happened in this place, or I can't remember exactly who you are, in terms of I can't give your name or precisely how you're related to me, the emotional tone that I have when I meet with you is still something that's, uh, that's intact. And, and that's a very important feature, that this emotional response, the emotional recognition is there much, much later, even when the, the intellectual, the cognitive content is going. But one of the important <clears throat> things about this is that when, some, when I have dementia and someone is trying to care for me and is getting frustrated because I said something to you this morning and now you've forgotten it, you must remember what I said to you. Don't you remember? We've been here before. Don't you remember what happened here? Oh, you must be able to remember. Come on, try harder. All you're doing when you're doing that is you're just battering against this closed door. And however much you batter, you're not going to be able to recover. And actually, that's a kind of cruelty to people to try and say, come on, try and remember. Um, because... The problem is, it makes me, you the person with dementia, it makes me feel stupid. I feel a failure. I feel shame that I, I know I ought to remember. For goodness sake, this is really important. I just can't remember. And so, and yet you are now being treated like a child. 
or I feel lost. And so trying to understand the way that it feels, trying to enter into the experience of the other person uh, is a very vital part of care, and particularly of spiritual care. That we mustn't exacerbate the shame. We mustn't make people feel stupid. Uh, we must reassure them and, and, and that, uh, not to emphasize the things that they can't do, but try and encourage them on the things that they still can do. Although dementia starts <clears throat> as a pathological process, so it starts, there are actually things happening within brain cells. There are degenerative processes spreading across the brain. It has these amazing consequences and often devastating and painful consequences. At a personal level, it affects the way I think of myself. At a relational level, this affects every relationship I'm in, and also at a spiritual level, inevitably, this is going to affect the relationship I have with God himself. And so, we must always consider that, that complex interplay that's going on. In other words, we mustn't just focus on the individual with dementia, because dementia is, is a disease which actually affects everybody who's concerned, and therefore we've got to think about this complex interplay between family members, with friends, uh, people in the church, <clears throat> pastoral carers, professionals, and so on. <clears throat> Everyone is brought in together. Now, we can see that in the modern world that puts so much emphasis on I, my right to choose, my life, I do it my way, you can see how much uh, dementia becomes a challenge to that. In um, Descartes' famous words, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And as has been pointed out, thinking, a crucial part of thinking, is remembering. So if my identity is based on who on my thinking, then my identity is based on my remembering, on my ability to remember my story and remember uh, who I am. And, and this is one of the dominant metaphors in the secular thinking, particularly in a postmodern culture. The idea in the secular world is that each of us is writing our own story. Each of us is writing this wonderful novel of my own life. And I am creating an identity for myself. I am somebody special. I am unique. This is my story. And the problem comes if I start to lose my mind. What happens to my story? What happened? Who am I if I can't remember who I am? <clears throat> and so this does strike right at the heart of what it means to be human. Who is it who holds our human identity? And this is where we come on to the spiritual perspective. And this is mainly <clears throat> where I want to focus, in the spiritual care, a spiritual understanding of dementia. <clears throat> so as we've seen, dementia seems so threatening because it challenges our common understanding of what it means to be a human person, <clears throat> of knowing and remembering my own story, putting myself in, in this drama, remembering how I was brought up as a child with sometimes painful, difficult, uh, maybe traumatic memories, maybe wonderful memories, remembering how God entered into my life, remembering how I was called to Christ, remembering have these different episodes in my life. This is all, this is who I am. This is my personal story. But once we look at the biblical perspective, we realize that actually my identity, who I am, is, doesn't all rest in my brain. It doesn't all rest in my memories. Actually, 
it's much more profound than that because it is God himself who defines who I am. And I love this line from <clears throat> a modern worship song, uh, which is a line that's repeated throughout, and it simply says, I am who you say I am. In other words, I cannot define myself. I cannot say, this is who I am. This is my identity. My identity is defined by God himself. I am who you say I am. Now, that takes humility, doesn't it? You know, the, it's great to strut the stuff and say, I did it my way. You know, but there's, a, there's an arrogance, isn't there? There's a, there's a desperate arrogance. And it takes humility to say, you know what, Lord? I am who you say I am. Um, and so as we reflect on this, it's God who knew me, God who knew you and loved you before the foundation of the world. You know, if you're a believer, God wrote your name into the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Isn't that a mind-boggling thought? And that he knew every day that was going to be written in your book before one of them came to be. That's what it says in Psalm 139. In other words, God planned and God knew that you were going to be sitting there on that seat today in July 2023 as we're talking about dementia. He knew. He purposed. He planned. This is not an accident. It was God who called us into existence in our mother's womb. It's God who sustains and upholds every breath, every heartbeat. And my spiritual father, John Stott, used to tell me that sometimes when he was walking just by himself and just reflecting, he used to feel his pulse and try to give thanks to God for every heartbeat, reminding himself that every heartbeat that comes is a new gift from God. Every breath that we breathe is a new gift, a new presence uh, from God himself. It's God who counts the hairs on my head, and if he counts the hairs on my head, then he counts the cells in my brain. He knows the ones that are firing well and the ones that are already starting to decay. It's Christ himself who called me, who died and rose again for me, who forgave me, who filled me with his spirit, and has gone ahead to prepare a place for me. And do you think that a disease process going in your brain is going to affect all of that? Is going to destroy it? Is going to damage it? Do you think that God is not big enough to encompass the challenges and the difficulties that we have by being made out of dust and of having physical bodies? And so our human identity, our significance, our story is held in God himself and in the unchangeable reality of God's love. And therefore, that's where our stability lies. That's where our security lies. That's where our hope lies. It lies in the fact that God is the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus Christ is the same, and he knows us, and he loves us, and he died for us, that's where our security lies. Whatever happens here on earth, nothing can touch this. Even if my brain starts to malfunction, even if I become confused and disorientated and lose my memories, as I said on Tuesday, I, this is close to home for me because I went through a very deep and, and painful psychiatric illness some years ago, and I became extremely confused and was hallucinating and completely lost contact with reality. And yet, by God's grace, I was held in his arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms. I will still be me, a unique person, known and loved by others, and ultimately safe in the loving knowledge of God himself, my personhood is secure in the eternal knowledge and covenant love of God himself. Time and time again in the scriptures, God says, I know you. And that, that knowledge, the fact that God knows us, 
is so central. I will always be me. I will always be worth what God thinks of me. And so I'm held secure in the unchangeable reality of God and his purposes, which stretch from before the foundation of the world to the future ages of the ages. So that's where we need to build our foundations. Those are the spiritual glasses we need as we start to wrestle with dementia. And yes, sometimes we know these wonderful truths in theory. We find it actually very hard uh, to live it out in practice. And, And maybe these are things which we need to remind ourselves of every day if you're caring for a loved one with dementia or if you yourself are aware that this process has started every day uh, reminding ourselves of the the everlasting arms that are there. Uh, A friend of mine was caring for her father, who was a uh, a great man of prayer, and uh, he'd lived his life as as a wonderful Christian servant, but then he'd been affected by dementia And the process had had gone and developed, and he'd come to the point where he was virtually completely silent. He he just never spoke at all. He he was being cared for at home. His loving daughter uh, was caring for him. And he was sitting on the sofa and just staring blankly into space. And it so happened, the television was on, and it it was a Sunday evening, and it was songs of praise. And uh, the whole theme of the program was about prayer. And on an impulse... My friend, his daughter, said, do you still pray, Dad? And he said, yes. And he hadn't spoken for days. And she said, what do you say to God when you pray? And there's a long pause, and he says, I say, hello. And that was it. And when she told me this story, I thought, You know, that is so amazing, isn't it? And so profound. And who knows what is going on deep inside at a non-verbal level? Who knows what the Spirit is doing deep in the heart? Never underestimate the deep and hidden work of the Spirit in the believer with dementia. These, These wonderful words in Psalm 42, deep calls to deep. That's in the context of suffering. It's in the context of suffering that often the deep things of the person and the deep things of God, that means a lot to me again in my own history, deep calls to deep. Yet as carers, we're also called to recognize the lostness and the distress and the confusion and the anxiety and sometimes the anger or the apparent personality change, the broken relationships which dementia can cause. So we mustn't sanitize or just pretend that it's all wonderful uh, as we care for people with dementia. And and this is something that I've been very struck by, both in my own personal experience. Um, I've had personal experience. Both my mother was affected by dementia and then my very close relative, my uncle, uh, and I was closely involved in his care. And then um, Celia's mother has also been affected by dementia. So these are things which are very close to us and our family. And I've seen the, the, the tensions and the stresses that this can cause. So this, how do we care for people with dementia? How do we care spiritually for them? Again, my focus is going to be on spiritual care. And As I said earlier on, I'm very conscious that this is still a new area for the Christian community. This is something we're still learning about, and uh, we've got lots to learn from one another. And and maybe I can challenge you. Maybe there are people here, you know, God has been leading you and giving you insight and experience and, and wisdom and skills, and maybe you've got more to learn about the spiritual care of people with dementia, and maybe you can pass it on. Maybe you can learn new things and ways of showing the love of Christ to people with dementia. But in my own uh, reading and reflection, 
uh, these are some of the essential things that we can do as we're caring spiritually for people with dementia. Uh, we can show solidarity with them, that we're going to be with them, whatever happens. We can be reinforcing who they are, reminding. Uh, some people talk about re-membering. What, what we're trying to do is to re-member for the individual, remind them, uh, help them to re remind them who they are, and, uh, and bringing hope. And um, I found very, very helpful this book by Joanna Collicutt, who's, which is called Thinking of You. And uh, I strongly recommend this book. It's, in, it's on the bookstall. And uh, Joanna Collicutt is a very unusual person. She's a qualified neuropsychologist, so she knows all about the, um, the neuroscience and the psychology. But she's also a, a minister in the Church of England, and she's got years of experience of the spiritual care of people with dementia. So she combines the scientific, the psychological, and the spiritual. And her book is quite uh, dense. It's got a lot of material in it. It's not necessarily an easy read, but I, I think it's a really helpful resource. And one of the diagrams in that book I've, I've adopted here, and it's slightly adapted from it, but at the heart of it, <clears throat> our aim as we care and support this person with dementia is peace. And Joanna points out, of course, this is, this is shalom. This is the biblical idea of, of, of helping the person to understand shalom, to be at peace. Or, you know, put simply, everything is okay. And then there are these three aspects. And uh, if, we, if we go first about uh, on the left, there is being present. Solidarity says, I'm here with you. I will not abandon you. And we can learn how to be present uh, with the person who has dementia. And then up at the top, identity. You are still special. You are cherished. You're a unique person. And this is where this idea of remembering uh, the person, helping them and reminding them of what's important for them. And then making meaning, helping again as the person with dementia so often loses the sense of their own story and feels they're lost and cannot have any sense of, of where they're going. Uh, what we're called to do is to help people to recover that sense of meaning, but in particular, uh, reminding them of hope. This is not the end of the story. Uh, it will be different. Um, so when I am forgetting who I am, I need you to remind me. I need you to comfort me, remind me what has been important to me, what I've built my life on, to remember for me. When I can't pray for myself, I need to know that you will pray for me that you will read the scriptures, you will sing Christian songs for me, you'll lead me in worship. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about music, uh, time and again, uh, it seems that music is one of those powerful roots into deep into someone's um, the memories, that musical memories are stored differently from where other memories are stored, and often they seem to recapture. But it's particularly, therefore, it's the music of the past which is most powerful. And in a spiritual context, it's the old hymns. It's the old hymns which come back from childhood or at very significant parts of, um, of a person's life. It's often those old hymns are the most significant, the most powerful. We certainly notice this with our, our mother, that for a long, lots of the time she was quite unresponsive. She lay in the bed. Even when we went to visit her and speak to her, she would just lie there. But when we got round as a family and sang some of the hymns from our old brethren assembly past, when we were children, 
all of a sudden, to our amazement, she would join in. And she was singing the harmony, and, 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 and she was there joining in with the songs. It tapped something very deep. So, so music is a, is a remarkably powerful uh, force that God has given us to, to reach out to people. Interestingly also, for many older people, it's the authorized version of the Bible uh, which is, makes most sense. And uh, many people have said that, even though they've loved uh, in their later life the modern translations and so on, actually in dementia it's often the authorized version and the old, the old these and thous uh, which, which make the most sense. So when you're feeling, when I'm feeling frightened, I need you to reassure me that I'm safe, that you'll always love me, and that you won't abandon me. One of the remarkable things is that, again, as we said before, although people's cognitive abilities are often completely lost, the capacity for emotional intuition remains so that people pick up the emotion. If we're feeling uh, distraught, anxious, burdened, then we're likely to communicate that to the person with dementia. But if we can, they they will intuit our genuine love, our genuine concern, and the fact that we want to be there for them. Uh, That is something which can be intuited. They're sensitive to qualities of trustworthiness, love, warmth, respect. So, you know, there's a real difference between different forms of love. There is pity love, and there is respect love. And pity love, I'm afraid, is very common. It's very common in the, amongst, uh, in the NHS and among professional carers. And pity love is very efficient and very supportive, but the trouble is, it is horrible to be pitied. It's horrible when people say, oh, poor thing, you know, you're such a wreck, but I'm here and I'm going to look after you. You know, that... There, and then there is respect love. And respect love is where we respect the person. We respect who they are, even though they're so affected by disease or by pathology. And respect love, amazingly, is the way that God treats us. He doesn't pity you. He respects you as a wonderful being made in God's, God, made in his own image. And that's why we are called to treat one another with a respect love. By just being there with the other person, we can express emotional intimacy and presence. So that's one of the things I've learned. You know, again, most of us are such great talkers that we just want to go and visit people and spend time. Then we just want to talk, 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 talk. But actually, many people with dementia, they don't want talk, 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 talk. They can't really understand what you're talking about. But just to be there and just not to have this sense of of feeling uncomfortable because I'm not saying anything, but I'm just sitting there with you, showing solidarity, that can be incredibly important. And what we've got to do as we're there with a person is we've got to have, I often think of it, you know, when I'm trying to support people, as having my antennae, my receiving apparatus, turned up to maximum. So I'm not saying anything, but I'm desperately trying to pick up the clues. What's going on here? How is this person feeling? How can I help them best? And that means in particular trying to pick up the body language. How how are they using their bodies? How are they using their hands? What is the facial expression? How are they moving? These things can tell us a great deal about what's going on deep inside. And so this kind of prayerful... So silently praying for someone as you sit with them, praying for wisdom, uh, showing loving, gentle attention, uh, listening, watching the body language, that's important. Importance of touch. Um, Many people with dementia are hungry for physical contact. They don't know how to express it, they don't know how to say it, but deep down they long for that physical contact. But it's important to respect physical boundaries. One of the problems with carers is so often they just 
move in in a sort of completely uh, insensitive way. Uh, and so respecting physical boundaries, asking permission, is it okay if I hold your hand? Is it okay if I give you a hug? Uh, would you like me to sit here with you? Um, but particularly what Joanna Collicutt says is the importance of hands. Simply holding a hand or just stroking, massaging hands can be incredibly significant and worthwhile and communicates at a deep level. Just while I was doing that story, I was reminded also about the importance of children. You know, something I've seen time and time again is that just like music, children and babies seem to communicate at a deep, deep level with older people with dementia. And therefore, I don't think we should try and shield our children from, uh, or grandchildren from exposure to people with dementia. Sometimes it's helpful to explain in advance, you know, that granny will probably won't remember you and she may say some strange things and don't worry about this if this happens and so on. But actually, it's fantastically helpful both ways. It's really helpful for the person to be exposed to young children and it's really helpful for the children themselves to understand part of the narrative of human life um, rather than be shielded and removed from that. When we're listening attentively, we have to again choose our words carefully. It's much more helpful, this is Joanna Cullicutt says, I don't understand, explain that to me again, or what are you trying to say, rather than, oh, you're just talking rubbish, oh, it doesn't make sense, oh, don't worry about it, it's not important. So in other words, respecting what the person is saying, even if it doesn't seem to make sense, listening, and then trying to respond to the emotional significance of the words. So, so what is the deeper message that this person is trying to communicate? Um, and we validate the experience of another person by accepting its emotional reality and its power, and what some people call subjective truth. So I think the experience of many people, including my own, of, of, of interacting with people with dementia, is although as Christians, quite rightly, we want to be wedded to the truth, we want to, to speak the truth, we want to live the truth, the problem with dementia is often that people become detached from reality and therefore they think what they are experiencing, what they are remembering is the truth. They're utterly convinced of it and, and yet we know from the outside that it's not the objective truth. But just to say, oh, that's rubbish. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, you just need to understand. That's completely wrong. What experience has taught most of us is that that isn't helpful and actually can just make the anxiety worse and the confusion, and therefore recognizing that actually sub at a subjective level that emotional experience is true, it's, it's not helpful to say, oh, no, no, you're not feeling that. That's not right. It's much better to say, I understand that you're feeling very anxious. It may be that what you're feeling anxious is about, you know, is I need to get home. You know, I've got to look after my children and they'll be worrying about me. You know, it may be that all that is completely wrong, but the subjective truth is there. And it's much better uh, in general to acknowledge that. Uh, Joanna Collicutt says this, in general, it's good to affirm the reality of the person's feelings, but not to do this in a way that compromises what she calls consensus reality too much. This is a complex area, and again, I don't claim to be an expert at all, but it's something we, we all of us have to navigate. I think something else which is very important for those of us who are evangelicals, and that is that uh, as a group, we tend to emphasize the importance of words, and we de-emphasize the importance of spiritual rituals. And yet, with people with dementia, it's often the other way around. That actually, rituals, physical repeated rituals, become 
much more significant and much more a way in that God can communicate with people. So therefore, rather than extempore prayers, sometimes formal prayers like you would find in a prayer book or in a, in a, in a hymn or something like that, those kind of repeated familiar prayers can become much more important. We've already talked about hymns, spiritual music. Sometimes significant objects become very significant. One of the things I've noticed is that what's called a prayer, a hand cross, a little wooden carved cross, which you can hold in the palm of your hand, uh, can actually be something incredibly significant. And it has a symbolic significance. I can hold this, and as I hold this, I can pray. And I can't think of any words to pray, but I know this cross means something. And that's what I'm holding on to. And then, you know, we need to think about our church services. Are our church services genuinely inclusive? Are we thinking about church services where people with dementia could come and feel comfortable? Uh, perhaps that means we need to think of, of special services which are orientated towards people with dementia. Suffering is not a question which demands an answer. It's not a problem which demands a solution. It's a mystery which demands a presence. Ultimately, why people get dementia, what it involves, why so much suffering is caused is a mystery to us. But our calling is to be there, to be the presence in the mystery of suffering. And just as I come to the end, I just want to acknowledge that the impact that dementia can have on loved ones and carers, it can have a, a devastating emotional and spiritual impact on a spouse or on children. And it seems to me, and particularly in the Christian community, this is something that is often not acknowledged or recognized. And, and some people and some Christians I know, and, and including uh, people in my family, have sometimes felt terribly guilty about the struggle we're having and the emotional reactions we're feeling to someone with dementia. Uh, and it's, and it's, we feel like we can't share this. It's almost unmentionable. You know, I can't share how much of a struggle I'm having uh, in my Christian community. I feel ashamed. And that can't be right, can it? I mean, as a, as a Christian community, we, we need to recognize the toll this can take on carers. Although we know in theory that the other person has lost their cognitive capacities, we can find ourselves drawn into repeated arguments, into conflict, and, and we may find all kinds of feelings coming up, feelings of frustration and anger and hurt and guilt and helplessness or a deep sense of failure. And one of the, one of the mechanisms, of course, is that many of us have had quite complicated relationships with our loved ones over the years. I mean, yes, there's been wonderful things and there's been good things, but there's also been a whole history of hurt or misunderstanding or confusion or whatever it is. And then when this loved person is developing dementia, a lot of that sort of stuff starts to reemerge uh, and, and, and makes it harder for us to to respond in an appropriate way. And um, this, this is partly because, you know, if I have so much shared history with this person, you know, so much of my own life has been tied up with this person, but now as this person seems to be losing them or changing or losing all the memories, what does that say about me? What does that say about the shared history we had together? Because this is something, I'm losing something as well. There's this deep sense of loss. And rather than pretending that that loss isn't there, I think actually it's much better, much healthier uh, to be honest with ourselves, but to find others with whom we can be honest with and express our feelings uh, of hurt. Uh, this is a, a very interesting book which I recommend called, Dash, uh, called Travelers to Unimaginable Lands. Um, it's a, written by a very experienced uh, psychologist who uh, supports, who herself has cared for people with dementia. And she's an extremely interesting writer. She's not a Christian, and I wouldn't by any means 
agree with everything she says, but she gives us some real insights into the issues for carers, uh, which I and my wife have really recognized. Here are some words from Joanna Collicott. Remember that there are things in life which cannot be fixed by you or anyone else. Dare to believe that simply being present with people in the valley of the shadow of death really does make a difference. Dare to believe it makes a difference. We shouldn't try to care by ourselves. Care is not an endurance test. We should, whenever possible, care with others. It is the community of care that reminds the other person of their belovedness. And I like these words from Ian Knox. When we are not being asked to work miracles, unless the miracle is that we are there. Ultimately, that's the most important thing. We're there. And finally, when we care for a person with dementia, with genuine respect, with sacrificial love and compassion, we're actually pointing towards the future. This is something that came home to me when we were caring for our, my, my mother because by God's grace, I suddenly realized I was going to meet my mother again in glory. And wouldn't it be terrible if she said, you know, it was a pity you didn't come and see me. It was a pity the way you cared for me. That wasn't, a one, that wasn't very good, was it? You know, and I suddenly realized I had to treat my mother not only because of once, who she once was, and who she was now, but who, by God's grace, she was going to become. And so when we care for someone with genuine love, with respect, with compassion, we're pointing towards the future. We're bearing witness to Christian hope, and we're saying this is not the end of the story. There's more going on here than you can see. So ultimately, it's about faith, hope, and love. May God give us this ability to see the reality with faith, to practice love, and to point to the hope of the future. Amen. We have a few minutes for some questions. Um, as usual, our, our stewards are able to pass a roving microphone along, so please put up your hand if you have a question for John. Hi, um, I'm taking my dad to the memory clinic uh, next Wednesday morning for assessment. Um, he's not a believer, so I'm, I'm listening to all this and I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I agree with all this. How do I start to, without losing hope, communicate the love of Jesus uh, evangelistically? with someone who is fading away in mm. front of me? Thanks, that's a really good question. And, and to be honest, I don't think I'm, I would be an expert at all in this. But just in general principles, what would I say? I would say, number one, you know, the dying thief, the story of the dying thief tells us that it's possible for people to find faith uh, even right up to the very end uh, and number two, what we know is that it, the prayer of faith is just a matter of crying out. It doesn't depend on, on the cognitive uh, abilities, on understanding. It's simply crying out, uh, Lord, save me. So I think carrying on, telling, you know, maintaining the spiritual care, uh, explaining that you're, you're praying, that you're loving explaining the story of the cross in simple terms, um, but at the same time respecting the individual. You know, we mustn't coerce. There is, there is I think, some similarity with the way you would evangelize very young children. Um, you know, what would be appropriate with the young child? Where would it become coercive or manipulative? We've still got to recognize uh, the uniqueness of the person, but pray in faith and trust that somewhere deep down, there will be a response. There was just a verse, actually, which came to my mind as I was just coming up, to the, uh, coming up here, and I, I just want to say it, just in case 
it's a verse for you, and it's, it's a, in Isaiah 49, 15, where uh, God says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And it's, I just wonder whether that's a word for someone here. Any other questions or comments? Yes, over there. Can I say thank you for what you've just said to me? I've been caring for a, a friend from church who I saw leading to dementia over the last six, seven years. And she died last October. But you've just taken me back through out the time that we shared together. She didn't know me. I did everything for her at one time, and eventually she came to the case of, who were you, what are you doing here? And she could get quite cross, actually. But we spent so many hours and hours and hours reading the authorised version. Hmm. And she could quote it herself. I've got it on my phone, where she's just recited Psalms and Psalms, hmm. Isaiah. She could, didn't know anything else, but stick her in the Bible. And, and there was times I'd get there, and she'd get cross with me. What are you doing here? And then she went in a home. Who's brought me in here? And to bring her out of the anger of that, mm. I'd start saying, I'd ignore in a way what she was saying. It sounds a bit rude, but I'd say, I lift my eyes to the hills. And she'd just recite the full psalm and mm. totally forget that she was upset and cross when I first got there. Mm. And yeah, you've just brought some lovely memories back. Thank you very much. <laughs> God <Yeah>. bless you. <laughs> and, and well done for being there. You were just there for her, weren't you? Anybody else? Is there someone over there? Oh, over here. Thank you. This might seem a daft question, but can you just reassure me that because we get a bit forgetful, that doesn't mean to say we're going down the path of dementia. I'll give you a typical example. I did some voluntary work with homeless people at the Birmingham City Mission. A few weeks ago, I didn't forget I'd got to do the God spot and the, I had to pick something out that I could speak in a simple way. I was 25, 30% of the way back to Kidderminster and I suddenly remembered I'd forgotten to bring my Bible back with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, because of that, it doesn't mean I'm getting dementia, no. does it, John? No, it doesn't. I, I think it's a very common worry, isn't it? And all of us, as we get older, find that we do things like that. We forget names. We forget to do things. And we can't even remember what we did this morning. If, um, and so that's a very common experience. So that's what's normal aging involves. And, and that's one of the, the trials sometimes of, of getting older. As someone put it, the, the difference, you know, forgetting where you've put your car in the car park is normal. Getting into the car and realizing you've forgotten how to drive, that's dementia. So you see that it's a different order of magnitude of, of loss. It is, uh, and, and yes, it's possible. I mean, you know, as the statistics show, you know, it's, it's something that may happen to all of us, and we need to, if you're seriously concerned about someone, then the memory clinic, that's what they're there for. And they will do detailed tests, and they will tell you very clearly what is going on. But uh, I think we can be reassured that the normal kind of forgetting that goes on when we get older is, is, n is not the same. The level of forgetting in dementia is at a much more severe and all-pervasive level. Question over there. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge what you said about ritual, and we would want to include communion in that. Uh, that's, that's very important with the person we visit. Uh, que uh, one question is, how much is, uh, to what it, what, how universal is the phenomenon of having ideas and concepts quite clear in the mind, but actually not uh, forgetting actually the term that represents that? Um, yeah, thanks, yes. Now, that, that's actually very well recognized. It's got a medical name, and it's called nominal aphasia. 
Aphasia is where you lose the power of speech, but nominal aphasia is where you just cannot think of a name or you cannot think of a term. And that is completely different from dementia. It's not a sign of dementia, but it's a normal process of the aging brain. Uh, and, and it's something that people often worry about, but it really isn't, uh, it isn't the process of dementia. I've realized we're running out of time. Uh, I, just, uh, as I just want to go back uh, to this, the retiring well course. And uh, my friend Helen Calder is here. And uh, she's going to be uh, at the front. And it's going to be able to, uh, she's, she's got flyers <laughs> of the uh, retiring well course. So if, if you are yourself are facing retirement or just in the early stages of it, or if you know somebody else, uh, can I recommend this course uh, and, and the workbooks that go with it? Thanks very much. And Helen will be down here at the front. Thanks, Alistair. I want to thank John very, very much indeed for being such a tremendous help to us today with this, for this vital subject and uh, to finish with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you for what we've heard this morning. We pray that you'll help us uh, to uh, absorb this truth and to put this into practice. And we thank you for that wonderful fact that even though there are all kinds of eventualities in life, the reality between us and you remains the same. You remain the same. You knew us before the foundation of the world. We pray that you'll help us to hold on to this most wonderful truth as perhaps things change in us and as things change in those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've got uh, the Bible reading at 11.15, and tomorrow morning we have the fourth of the seminar sessions in here when John's going to be helping us uh, with the subject of dying well. See you then. Thank you. Thank you so much.